Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so we're in Romans 8.1. We got through chapter 7 last week. Uh, talking about it's no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. We've um, hammered the point home, hopefully by this point, about the old man and the new man, that there is a separation, there's a division between those now, that if you're born again, um, your, your spirit is reborn. However, you're still carrying around this carcass that is corruptible. Um, and so Romans 8, the theme of, of Romans 8 is the believer getting victory over sin and eventually the creation. We'll get into the doctrine of glorification in this chapter about the glorified body, what's going to take place um, when the manifestation of the sons of God, um, when you're going to have a body that is saved from the presence of sin. But right now you're still in this flesh walking around in a prison and so it's warring against one another and so let's look at Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> right away Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the spirit, or not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So let's qualify the statement. A lot of times people look at that, um, that passage, and sometimes they can look at that and say, Well, there's no, maybe it's sinless perfection, or another thing they might look at is, Well, I can lose my salvation. Those kind of passages are confusing if you don't understand the old man or the new man. Okay, and so we see up here, we talked about last time, temporal and eternal. Let's look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 real fast. We'll go back to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, there's your flesh. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Your soul and your spirit are eternal things. You cannot see them but you know that they're there, okay? And so we have to understand the differences between that. So when you see the word condemnation or damnation, um, those are the same, they have the same meaning, okay? But oftentimes, if you don't understand the te if it's talking about temporal or is it talking about eternal damnation or condemnation, okay? So if you're in Jesus Christ, there is no eternal condemnation for you, okay? So let's look at some passages. 1 Corinthians 11 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 through 32. You have to put things in context and understand this doctrine of the old man and the new man, okay, the new birth. Okay? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-nine. 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Here's the definition. For this cause many are weak, and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now, we understand what he's talking about in sleeping. Uh, that's a Christian that's been taken out early. Okay? That's, that's a type of the death of the Christian. You don't, you're don't you not going to taste death, but he'll, he will take you out early if you live after the flesh. And we'll get into Romans 8.13. Okay? But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay? So the condemnation of the world is different than the condemnation of the Christian. Okay? He, uh, your, your spirit can be give, given over to Satan for the, for the destruction of the flesh, but the spirit is saved. Okay? And so you have to understand what he's talking. Is he talking about temporal or is he talking about eternal? Okay, look at the condemnation of the world. Look at Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. See the temporal? Fornication and cleanness and ordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness. Notice this, which is idolatry. So if you covet something, that's idolatry. All right. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, is that you? No. You're a child of God by the new birth, right? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, 
the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So, if you're not saved, you're a child of wrath. If you're saved, you're a child of God. Okay, however, we have to understand once again, when he's talking about in Romans 8.1, there is therefore no condemnation than which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So there's no eternal condemnation. Okay, don't mix those up. Look at uh, Romans 14, 23. You have to use some common sense a lot of times and when you read the Bible. Uh, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever not of faith is sin. Okay, is somebody going to be eternally damned because they eat lobster at, with not, not having faith? No. Are you under the law? Okay, but in, under the law, somebody could be cut off from among his people. That's Leviticus uh, 11, okay, for eating lobster. But you're not under the law, you're under grace, right? So that has no effect on you. So obviously the damned he's talking about here is a temporal damnation, not having faith, Okay. Uh, look at Galatians 5, the great chapter on the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. Look what he says here, almost the same thing he says in Romans 8, 1, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, capital S, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust, or for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So Satan would have the lust of the flesh be preeminent in your life so that you could not do the things that God would have you to do. Correct? That's why feeding your flesh is dangerous because it's, you're making provision for the flesh. Therefore, you cannot do and fulfill the will of God if you're constantly feeding the flesh. Okay, look at James. James chapter 4. Notice the lust again. James chapter 4, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Remember Paul talking about your members? Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth. I can guarantee you, as the Bible says here, every war has been started because of lust. Lusting after other things, lust, wanting to kill your brother because of lust. Okay, you look at all the things going on in the world because you're living in the, in, in this world is the, the, the God of this world, that Satan is, this is his world system. Anything good come from it? Sure, there's good parts of it that you can enjoy, but your home's not here, it's in heaven. This is, you're not a citizen of this country. Yes, you are physically, but not spiritually. See, because all this is going to go up in a fervent heat. So what's all the, the fuss about getting upset about it? To be spiritually minded and carnally minded are two different things. But you look at all the wars and they, they happen because of lust. Anybody ever heard of Helen of Troy? Right? Remember the Greeks and the Trojans going to war? That's a true story. That's history. They went to war over a woman. Thousands of Greeks and Trojans died because of one woman. Because of lust. I mean, that's, that's a whole lot of people to die over, over just something as, as, as trivial, trivial, honestly, as that. But what did, what did Eve, what did she do in the garden? She lusted. Right? She lusted after that fruit. Look what came from it. Death. Look at James chapter 1. But every man is tempted, verse 14. James 1.14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, so let's go back to Romans chapter 8. So we're talking about temporal damnation or condemnation for the Christian. Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 13, you, you cannot read Romans 8 and not have the understanding of the old man or the new man, or this will not make sense. Look right here, Romans 8, 13, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Well, what's when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Even the death of a Christian physically can be taken out early. That's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, many sleep. Why? 
They didn't discern, discern the Lord's body. They were coming together not to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Him, but to show off. Look how much food I can bring. They were coming together to get drunk. They weren't discerning the Lord's Supper, what He did at the cross of Calvary. And so for that, there was a heavy penalty to pay in that early church. Could you imagine if the Lord still meted out the, uh, you know, the justice the way He did in the early church? When those apostles were walking around, like I talked about before with Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Ghost, dropped them dead, right? Well, there's temporal damnation. Where's Ananias and Sapphira right now? They're in heaven. If they're saved, it seems like they were in the, in the passage. But the Lord said, nope, take them out. So that living after the flesh thing God takes seriously. Now let's look at eternal damnation. Let's look at the difference. It's getting... Man, it's quiet in here. <laughs> Awfully quiet. See? All right, go to John 5. Look at verse 24, and now he's going to be talking about eternal damnation. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, so that the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, right? Hath everlasting life. Notice the present tense. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Okay, you believe on Christ, you have eternal life because Jesus Christ is eternal life. You have His life. Okay, you cannot die. Even though you might die in the flesh, you're going up. Okay? Look at Mark 6, uh, 16, 16. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That's eternal damnation. Okay, look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, look at verse 19, very familiar passage. Well, look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. See how that matches up with Romans 8, 1? But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, this is eternal that light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his de deeds may, uh, may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Whatever doth make manifest is light. That's Ephesians 5, I think um, 23, I believe it is. But uh, the word of God manifests light upon your sin. Say, whatever doth make manifest is light. And so, he that doeth good, doeth truth, he comes to the light because he knows, well, he's born again of the Spirit of God, and he knows that he's been doing things he shouldn't do. So, you, what you do is you get in the Word of God, and you get washed in the water of the Word, just like in that tabernacle, right? That, the brazen laver, there's a pool of water. Aaron and his sons would go in there, and they would wash their hands, right? They've been walking around in the world, and they go in there, and they look at that, that labor, which is like the Word of God, it's like a mirror looking back at you, and you get washed in the water of the Word, you get cleaned up before you go into the sanctuary, before you sit down at the table of showbread, and that light from the candlestick is shedding light on the Word of God. See how that works? And so, if you do a truth, you're, you're, you're going to naturally want to do right. That's that new man, okay? But the condemnation of the world is lights come into the world, and they turn the other way. They say, well, I don't, uh, they don't have an excuse according to Romans 1.20. See, they say, well, I, I just don't believe God. Well, okay, you can take all, all the things in the world, and there's everything in the world in God's creation that is a type of Him. You see the lilies? Well, it's a lily of the valley. He is the lily of the valley. See the roses out here? Well, He's the rose of Sharon. You see the stars that are up in the heavens? Well, He's the bright and morning star. You see the sun that's in the, it, that shines every day? Well, he's called the sun of righteousness. There's the light. He said, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. So the problem with the world is that they see the light and they turn from it. It's not because they didn't have a chance. They just didn't want it. Everyone has a chance. If they just earnestly believe and they want something from God, God will give it to them. That's why we have missionaries. Amen? So let's go back. So we understand between temporal and eternal. 
So you have to understand that when you're reading Romans 8, 1. Okay, so the, like I said, the theme is the believer getting victory over sin and eventually the creation. So let's go back to Romans 8. That was the introduction. <laughs> You've got to set it up, though, so that you have the right understanding before we get into the rest of the chapter. Verse 2, he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that is weak through the flesh, God sending his son, his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. All right, so let's look here. Come on. Yes. So we see three laws working here the law of spirit and life. Okay? When you get saved, we talked about this last time. If you have a born again spirit, you're baptized into the body of Christ. You're spiritually circumcised from the flesh. You're cut loose from it. That's a law. That's what takes place when you get saved. What happens when you die? Do you go up or do you go down? You go up because you have the power of the resurrection inside of you. Okay? Because he lives, we can also live. So that's a law. All right? We have the law of sin and death. If you're not born again, okay, you're going to be conformed to the image of your father, the devil. Okay? That's, you're going to go down. That's a law, just like gravity. You can throw something up, it's coming down. Okay? It's going to happen. It governs the, governs the universe. So the law of sin and death, is everything getting better or is it getting worse? Is your body corruptible or incorruptible? Corruptible. You'll figure that out when you're about 40. Okay? Some of you 20-year-olds in here are thinking, I'm good to go. You just wait. I've got a degenerative disc disease. So the little discs in my back have pretty much gnawed down to nothing. Okay, they degenerated. My little shock absorbers. They're not getting better. They don't get to come back. Okay, even with surgeries, it can't help it. Okay, so, so that's that law of sin and death. That's an Adamic nature that you got from your daddy. And get, you're going to die. As, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, right? We have the law of God. That's, that's the decal. Well, there's 613, but we're just talking about the Ten Commandments, right? That's, is that law holy or unholy? It's holy. There's nothing wrong with the law. The one who gave is the law giver. The problem is your flesh. Your problem is you couldn't keep the law 100%. Jesus Christ, that's why he came. He kept the law 100%. Therefore, that sacrifice was accepted. And therefore, we can go free. Okay? Let's look at it here in the passage. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, your flesh couldn't keep it 100%. Because you still think, have things going on up here that are sinful. Even though somebody might not see it on the outward manifestation, it's still going on up here and in here. Right? It was weak through the flesh. God sending his, his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. All right, let's look at a couple passages again. Look at Romans 1. Let's just look at Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. All right, came in the likeness of sinful flesh. All right, let's look at, uh, what was the other passage I was going to look at? Oh, it's, uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now let's look at verse... Now let's just look at verse 20. Let's see what kind of... Kind of Christian you are, compare yourself to the Lord here. For what glory is it if when we, when we be buffeted for, our, for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For hereunto were ye called, because Christ 
also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Can you do that? Mm -mm. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Says Somebody says something to you, can you keep your mouth shut? Amen. Uh, where am I at here? Oh, yeah. And when he suffered, he threatened not. Even Paul did that. He got smacked in the mouth. He said, you whited sepulcher. Oh, I didn't know you were the high priest. You liar, Paul. <laughs> There's that old man. He knew exactly who that was. <laughs> See, but it was no more him that doeth, that the sin that dwelleth in him. But committeth himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, see that, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Okay? So because he died, we, we have that righteous, his righteousness. But you look at, you just take an examination sometime and you look at that trial of the Lord Jesus Christ and you ask yourself, would you have done the things that he did for your enemies? There's not one man standing here because everybody, when somebody reviles you, you want to revile back. You want to answer back. You want to get even, all those kind of things, right? Not the Lord. 100% to the will of the Father. He kept the law. 100% so that we don't have to keep it to be saved. Go back to Romans 8. So he condemns sin in the flesh. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. Here we go. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. So, once again, you got this whole... Um, Look at spiritual and carnal. A spiritual person. Does that mean that they've attained a, a spiritual perfect or a sinless perfection? No. Because you're still in the flesh. But I'll tell you what they have. They have a long look to the judgment seat of Christ. They're looking at things in a spiritual manner. They're trying to do right. They delight in the law of God after the, after the inward man. It doesn't mean that you don't fall and you're not going to stumble and you're not going to mess up. Just like we, I preached, was it Wednesday, about Elijah. Right? He messed up. But he's a spiritual man because his mindset was always about spiritual things, not about carnal things. Okay? Carnal man is always going to be thinking about the things here and now. Set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth. So how are you looking at people? Are you looking at people as souls that need to be saved, or are you looking at them for what they are on the outside? That's a spiritual man. But ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and fear, lest I also be tempted. The qualifier there is a spiritual man, not a carnal man. What's a good example of a carnal man is who? Esau. What was he thinking about? The here and the now. He was hungry. His God was his belly. You ever known Christians like that? Sure. And you might fall into that category yourself if you're not careful. If you're constantly more, uh, looking at the things that are down here, you'll have a tendency to be like Esau. So that spiritual man who is always thinking about the law. He has the long look. He's making his decisions based on the judgment seat of Christ, not on the things which are just right here in front of him. Because these things right here, are just, they're, just, they're temporal. They're not eternal. Okay? And so you can see the difference between spiritual and carnal. Let's look at the um, church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Look what he says to the church at Corinth. Does that mean they're not saved? No. They're saved. They're just carnal, carnally minded. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual... But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. They're babies. 
I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. Now there's, here's the definition. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walk as men? Now this is, this, is, this is most times what people's idea of carnal Christian is, and it can be that. But they would like to put in there drinking, cussing, and smoking. But what is Paul talking? What's he say here? What's the definition of a carnal Christian? Envying, strife, and divisions. You know what Satan loves to do to a church? He loves to sow discord among the brethren. He likes to get you in there. He likes to have lust take over. Envy, strife, and division will take over a church. And then what, what takes place is he comes in there and divides it, and you've got a church split. Because what? Because you've got a bunch of carnal Christians. What? Which, by definition from the Bible, not my definition, are babies. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full, of full age. Notice this, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So one of the reasons that you need milk is so that you can discern between good and evil. That's not all the deep things. That's, we're not talking about necessarily always just prophecy. People, when, when, when you say meat, they always, oh, we're going to get into this. We're going to talk about Daniel's 70th week and... You know, all that, no, that's, that's part of it. But the thing about the meat is, is it gives you discernment from the Word of God. So you can look at character types in the Bible, and you can begin to point certain people out that you know that might fit that character type, like Absalom. So you're using your, your, your senses or exercise to discern both good and evil by the meat. So people that are babes are oftentimes, they're, they're the ones stirring up problems in your church. It didn't say they weren't knowledgeable. Was the church at Corinth knowledgeable? He said, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So you can be real knowledgeable and be carnal. Amen. Don't ever, ever, ever mistake knowledgeable people for spiritual. Like I said a couple weeks ago, some of the most carnal Christians I've ever known were preachers. Because their eyes were on everything down here. Their God was their belly. When it came to spiritual things, they could have cared less about that. They cared more about the ball games and everything else, man. That's what came out of their mouth. Yet they're, pre they're preachers. What the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They might have the gift that does not make them spiritual. Don't mistake that. Amen? Man, it's thick in here. All right, let's go back to Romans 8. These are just some things. Think about. Verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the kingdom of God is not, um, is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not, it's not a physical thing, right? But look at verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither, neither indeed can be. Notice this doctrinal statement, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. All right. Are you in Christ or are you in the flesh? Well, if you're born again, you're in Christ. Although you can sin. If you're lost, you're in the flesh. Okay? Because you've never been cut loose from that flesh. You're still in Adam. And you're going to die. If you're in Christ, we're all going to be made alive. Okay? Look at verse 9. Be you're not, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So I guess that throws out the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man, doesn't it? Everybody says, well, God's our Father. He doesn't know you. Not if you're lost. Look at Galatians chapter 4.
Look at Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, notice this, that after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye did desire again to be in bondage. Notice that. God didn't know you until you were born again. He knew of you, but he didn't know you. He said, I never knew you. But I did all these wonderful things, Lord, yeah, but I never knew you. You didn't have a relationship with me. See that? Now you're brought in by the spirit of adoption. Now God knows you. He knows you by your name. Someday he's going to call your name, and you're going up. That's going to be a glorious day. That's when you're going to get that glorified body. But right now we've got to deal with the lust of the flesh. We've got to deal with this this prison that we're in. But notice that. He said that, now if any man, to go back to Romans 8, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. There's, it's black and white. All right, let's look at verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Let's, let's uh, go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Familiar passage, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Notice this, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. See, you've got the Spirit of Christ in you. And the life which I not live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. One of the uh, greatest verses in all the Bible, isn't it? If you're born again, right? It's, it's the Lord himself that's living in you. That life that you have now, it's God's life. It's Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you just think about that and just put it in context that we have the opportunity to have God's Spirit dwelling in us and ministering through us, and we're just a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners. But God uses us in spite of, of that. It's pretty, it, that's a miracle in and of itself. All right, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. The body is dead because of sin. He... He condemns sin in the flesh. But look at verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see what he's talking about. He's looking forward now. He's going to be getting into the doctrine of glorification. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Notice the inheritance. Neither doth corruption put on a, a corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Notice there's the, that's what he's talking about, dying. Uh, we shall not all sleep. There it is. But we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Remember that law we talked about earlier? So one day you're going to be changed. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 3. No, that's not Philippians. Uh, yes, Philippians 3, verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Someday you're going to have a body just like Christ. Go to 1 John chapter 3, familiar passage. 1 John chapter 3, let's start at verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it was present tense, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We, we don't really understand that. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, what you get to do in the millennium of all the things as far as the the Bible doesn't give you all the details, but you know you're going to be walking around in a glorified body that is saved from the presence of sin, and you'll have the mind of Christ. You won't even think about sin anymore, and you'll be just like Him. Now, that's something to think about. But right now, we have to deal with this flesh, right? So let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 8. So he's talking about quickening your mortal body by the spirit that dwelleth in you. That's the power of the resurrection that resides in every born-again believer, spirit of God. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You don't have any debt to pay to it anymore. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Notice this. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Now let's go back to Romans 6. Now remember we talked about yielding? Romans 6.13, notice he says, Through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh. Verse 13, 6.13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Look at verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey... His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Notice that once again. How do you get victory? Through the Spirit. Through what? Yielding. Submitting. Obedience. Obedience. Yielding. So when the Holy Spirit comes along and he says, uh, turn that thing off. Quit, quit listening to that. You, can, you have a choice. You can either keep going your way or you can listen to the Spirit of God and you can do it your way or His way. Because the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one or the other, so that you cannot do the things you would. So you've got all kind of temptation and everything out there and that's why it's very dangerous about what you put in front of your eyeballs. How do you get victory? Through the Spirit. You can't do it on your own. If you try to do it on your own, it's going to be called will worship, as Paul calls it in Colossians 2. And it's going to be your will doing it, not God's. And it's always going to go back. The dog has returned to its own vomit. It always will. Your, your flesh is always going to go back to its highest level of training. So whatever you put into that flesh for how many ever years that you did, if you don't mortify the deeds of the flesh, it's going to go back and do what it knows to do. Because that's what it wants to do. Understand? So it's got to be through the Spirit. You've got to get separated unto God. And you can mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit of God, not through your own will. It's one of the hardest things. That's why some of the, these chapters here, Romans 6, 7, and 8, are so important for the Christian to get victory. And understand it's not you that's delivering the victory. It's the Spirit of God. Now, I wish I could uh, live that as well as I could probably preach that. But everybody in here knows as soon as you walk out of these doors, there's going to be somebody that cuts you off. Or there's going to be something that's going to rise up that flesh. And you're going to just, that, all that spiritualness that you had in here is gone. Because that's that flesh. Okay? Uh, let's see here. Look, look, look back at Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. So you see the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for that or I wouldn't be where I'm at. Amen? So yield to the Spirit. You won't fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. All right, let's go ahead and we'll end it there. We'll pick it up at verse 15 next week and then we'll get into the doctrine of glorification. All right. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you for this blessed book and the truth you've given us, Lord, and, and the, the Holy Spirit to be able to understand it and the things that the world do not understand. Lord, you give us access to be able to understand those things, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book that you've given us. Thank you for the truth. Let's pray for the service today. 
pray for Brother Barry as he leads the choir. Pray for Brother Randy as he breaks the bread of life one more time and gives us what we need to hear. Father, we just thank you. Lord Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.